We're going to start walking through uh, a thing called We Are One Church. Uh, it's a kind of a values type series is what I would say. It's this trying to wrestle with, well, as a community, yes, we talked the last couple of weeks about being a community that's moving forward and it's inwards and it's outwards, but there's, there's values that shape every organization. So I've got a few here for us to look at uh, because these often take the form of mission statements or something like that, and that's what we're talking about sketching out as a leadership team for this church. Uh, so this is Google. Our mission from the beginning, our mission from the beginning, our mission has been to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. This is who Google are. They want to make this information available to everyone. Google, mission statement, next one. Tesla. Tesla's mission is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Tells us all we need to know about Tesla. Who, are, who else have we got up there? Whole Foods. Our purpose is to nourish people and the planet. We are purpose driven, a purpose driven company that aims to set standards of excellence for food retailers. Quality is a state of mind at Whole Foods Market. Next one Starbucks. Those of you that love Starbucks, you know that their mission is to inspire and nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. I think I could sell Starbucks. Next slide. And this is uh, Spotify. Our mission is to unlock the potential of human creati creati creativity by giving a million creative artists the opportunity to live off their art and billions of fans the opportunity to enjoy and be inspired by it. These, these mission statements come from a company's sense of, well, what are our values? If they didn't know what their values were before, there was no way for them to get to the point of having a mission statement. Whole Foods have to know that they care about quality food before they can have any mission statement to help everybody get hold of quality food. Spotify have to know that they care about music, and Starbucks have to know that they care about good coffee. Well, they care about average coffee, and you being able to get hold of that average coffee in the morning. These companies, they would say, have this common DNA. So everything in life has DNA, uh, and they would say that somehow a company can also have DNA. It's this common way of thinking that helps create those sense of mission statements. So what I would love us to do as a community is start to wrestle with that. Well, what are our values here? Now, of course, with anything, there's going to be some values that are completely central and some values, if we're honest, are just personal choice. There might be some things I like that you don't happen to like. I may like a certain type of music. You may like a certain other type of music. Those aren't really values that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. But I think as we narrow it down, there's something that we can find that, that's core to why we found this place as a community and how we move forward with mission and vision into what God has for us in the future. This is a picture of Pando. It's the biggest organism on the on, on the world, in the world. It's actually one tree, even though it has many sort of like things appearing out. It's got identical DNA in every single tree, and so it is classed as one organism. It is one thing that has one thing in common. We have different expressions. We are individual people, but somewhere for us, there's this sense of well, what what is it that we have in common? Who has God called us to be? What are we passionate about? Now, these could be ridiculous things if we decided we wanted them. We could say, do you know what? We're going to be the first carbon neutral church in Clifton Park. I'm not sure that's where we're going to go. It could be a really good thing to do, but I'm not sure that will become our essential value. But there are things that we can find, I think, maybe four, maybe five, maybe six, that give us that sense of we are one church. This is who God has called us to be in this community. And the first one, is easy. The first one's an easy one. I would love it if we could say this church is Jesus-centric. But here's the thing. Jesus-centric is far easier to say than it is to live out. It's far easier to say, oh, I'm on board with that. Yeah, of course I'm on board with that. I'm not going to say no to that. That would be ridiculous. I'd get fired. You'd have to leave the church. It's just, it's that sense of, well, of course we're Jesus-centric. But what does that really mean? How do we wrestle with that? So, 
in a goal of getting us out of here by 11 o'clock today, because we've got ponies for kids to ride and we've got things to do that are fun, um, we're gonna start with this passage in John chapter two, which I think helps us understand this idea. So Jesus has started his ministry in this Gospel John. John is one of the biographies of Jesus. If you're new to the Bible, there are four of them. Three of them are really similar. We call them the Synoptic Gospels. So there's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're almost identical. There's like key information that's exactly the same. John is like this free spirit. John's gonna do his own thing. He tells stories about Jesus that nobody else has told. Most of the other writers focus on Jesus teaching to big crowds. John focuses on the moments that he had with just his disciples. He talks about when there was just the 13 of them and Jesus starts to pour out just more and more detail. There's some common elements to help us know that they're talking about the same person. All four of them talk about Jesus feeding 5,000 people. All four of them talk about Jesus going to Jerusalem, being crucified, died, and, and being resurrected. But John wants to take this different perspective. So when you read John, you'll see slightly different things. So John starts his narrative of Jesus with this miracle in private, and then this big moment of like public declaration. If you're familiar with the stories, you might know this is the, called the cleansing of the temple. We'll read about it now, but to give you a brief summary, Jesus jumps in to a temple situation where there's a big marketplace and he cleans house. He kicks out everyone trading, everyone changing money. But what's interesting about this story is where John places it. All the other three writers say Jesus did this right before he died. This was the end of his ministry. John says it happened right at the beginning. Now, you might say, well, he did it twice. And if that's your opinion, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Absolutely, he could have done it twice. I would say that if they allowed him to do it a second time, they could have placed better security on the doors because this isn't usually the sort of thing you get away with doing twice. But I would suggest John moves this story and puts it in a particular place for a particular reason. Now, for us as good 21st century people, that can be difficult to handle. We have an obsession with chronology. So if I say to you, this happened, and then this happened, and this, then this happened, and you find out it happened in a different order, there's a natural reaction in you that says, oh, you changed the order. That wasn't true. A first century writer had no such qualms about moving stories around. Stories were for illustrative purposes. So John as a writer would have had no problem saying, I'm gonna take the temple clearing narrative and I'm gonna put it at the start because it tells you something about what Jesus was doing. Now again, it's not a big deal. You may disagree. You may wanna say that there was two of them. I don't have a problem with that. I would say, though, John has taken this story and said this story, of all stories, will tell us something about who Jesus is and what he was trying to do. So here we go. We're going to jump in with John when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover. Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables to those who sold doves. He said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. So I love this story about Jesus because when I grew up, I was always pictured, I was, was always given this picture of Jesus as this super meek, and mild person. It was someone who would never do you know, anything like this. I always pictured Jesus as the, the kid that got his, his lunch money stolen from him at, church, uh, at school. It was like this kid that, that was kind of wimpy and a man that was kind of wimpy as well. And suddenly you see this Jesus who's actually incredibly dynamic in this passage. He jumps in and he cleans house in the temple. Now, to help us understand this, we might need to know something about how Jewish people in the first century understood the temple. This was the place. Far more important to them was this temple than we would ever consider this building. Perhaps you have an attachment to this building, you have a sense that this is, we call it the sanctuary, but Monday through Friday, we have 80 kids after school running around in here causing absolute chaos. A Jewish community would never have allowed that to happen in their temple. 
To understand how they saw this place, this temple, we need to go back, back into their history and talk about the sort of things that happened in this temple. So this is from a passage called two, in a book called Two Chronicles, it's chapter seven if you want to look it up. When Solomon, who was king, finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, his love endures forever. In this story, God's presence comes into the temple and everything stops. This group of people saw that as so important. The temple was a place that was absolutely sacred. They held this God in such esteem that they wouldn't even pronounce his name. We know that the, the name for God in Jewish culture was something close to Yahweh, but we don't know exactly because when they wrote it down, they removed all of the vowels from the name because they wouldn't write the whole thing. This is the kind of sacred perception that Jewish people had of their God and their temple. And the temple was this place where this God dwelled and this place was incredibly important to them. But other things happened in the temple. Sacrifices were made in the temple to keep people's relationship with this God that was oh so holy. So in the Old Testament, you read passages like this that tell us about the sacrificial process. When anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. As a penalty for the sin they have committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. Anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for their sin. One for the sin offering, the other for a burnt offering. They are to bring them to the priest who shall first offer the one for the sin offering. He is to wring its neck, head from its neck, not dividing it completely, and to splash some of the blood of the sin offering against the side of the altar. The rest of the blood must be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. The priest shall then offer the other as a burnt offering in the prescribed way and make atonement for them for the sin they have committed, and they will be forgiven. Now to us years later, this concept is completely foreign. But somewhere in amongst all the blood, the entrails, and the mess, there was this sense of these people experienced forgiveness for the sins they'd committed, experienced the ability to have a relationship with this holy God in this holy temple. But anywhere where there's a practice like this, there's just a chance that there's some people who will use it as an attempt to make money off other people. And this is what had happened in Jesus' day. You see the need for a goat, for a pigeon, for a sheep, and so people had filled the temple courts with essentially livestock, farmyards, selling them to people that had come into Jerusalem from out of town. In the old days, people would have brought one of their own sheep or goats or lambs or pigeons. But as time had moved on and people had different trades, they weren't farmers as much anymore, there would be an opportunity to buy them. There were people coming in from other countries that came with different currency. There were now money changes in the table, so you would walk around trying to get the best rate for your money, trying to exchange it for local currency to buy the things that you needed. And this whole process had taken over more and more of the temple. So when you look at this picture of the temple here, all of those big spaces there, everything there was just taken over by a marketplace that dominated everything. Imagine the marketplace you've been in, just a local one here, just the, the yelling, the shouting, the noise, and then think about a marketplace in a country that still runs around marketplaces, and if you've been to one there, you know that all you can hear is just yelling and shouting and people trying to sell you different produce, and this was what the temple had become. Instead of the marketplace helping the temple work, the marketplace had dominated everything. It had taken over. The market had become central instead of the temple. 
This is the situation Jesus walks into. He stands on the edge of this, perhaps for the first time as an adult when we read the, 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 the biographies. And he is furious. He takes a whip and he charges in and he just begins striking, lashing out at everything. He tips over tables. He doesn't act like this perfect picture of a guy that we maybe imagine growing up. He tips over everything and causes absolute chaos. And then says this, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. He brings back the sense of what the temple was there for originally, but then he goes a step further. A step further, a step that I think almost every Jewish person listening would have been really uncomfortable with him saying. Next slide. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Jesus takes the temple, identified with a sense of God's presence, this is where God is, and he says, actually, no, the temple doesn't even matter anymore. I'm the temple. I'm the center of where God's presence is. Jesus takes the whole of the Jewish system and says, this whole thing centers on me. Just imagine what that must sound like to Jewish people in the first century. Think about if I stood up here one morning and said, hey, guys, you know this Jesus-worshipping thing we've been doing for the last however long? I've decided it's going to center on me now. You're going to come and you're going to worship me every Sunday morning, and it's going to be fantastic. Would you buy that? Of course you wouldn't. It just must have sounded so unbelievable. It was only the fact that he follows it through with death and resurrection that made the story tolerable to anybody. Maybe if I said that and I died and rose from the dead, maybe then you buy in. Maybe you say there's something different about this person. But at the time, to the people listening, this was one of the worst things he could possibly have said. But he boldly and proudly said, I am the center of everything. One of the values that I think we get to chase after and hold as a community is this sense of Jesus-centric. Jesus is in the middle of everything. Jesus is in the middle of everything. There's this passage uh, from the New Testament. I think it's the slide before, if you just jump back one, Jill. Jesus claimed this about himself, that he was the image of the invisible God. The God that had been in the temple from that moment, the God that had landed in such glory and that everything had stopped, he said, that's me. I am the outward image of that God. When you look at me, you are seeing this God whose name is so holy, you don't write it down. Whose presence is so scary, you won't walk into the building. I am that person, is what he said. That is what made him the center of everything moving forward. Now think about what it means to be in the center. We as human beings have this awful tendency to put ourselves at the center when we don't belong there. Think about just that from a perspective of astronomy. For years, we believed that the Earth was the center of everything. We believed that when you uh, sat on Earth, you were in the middle. The sun went over us. Some people believed it even disappeared every day and a new one was made the next day. Moon, same deal. Everything revolved around us. And finally, some incredible person, Copernicus, I think, first looked and said, you know what, I don't think that's accurate. I think that we actually revolve around this other thing, this sun. It's us that's moving. We aren't the center. And so the sun became the center of everything. But now we know even more. We know that actually our galaxy isn't the center of anything either. Our solar system is moving. Our galaxy is moving. And everything is held together by this much bigger something. Sometimes when I... Uh, have people say to me, I, I'll talk about my faith and, and my sense of who Jesus is and my sense of the something else afterwards. And I'll have occasionally people say to me, I don't understand how you can believe in that. Uh, it doesn't seem normal. And my reaction is, you think this is normal? 
we're standing on a rock that's moving at 60,000 miles an hour, and we don't feel like we're moving. We're spinning every day, and we don't feel like we're spinning. And we're standing under a sky that just goes on forever, and it feels normal. But is it really normal? I don't think any of this is normal. And the sense that this God is there holding it all together feels far more normal to me than anything else. We have a nasty tendency as human beings, both in terms of our overall sense as a species and our individual personalities to place ourselves bang smack in the center. And we just don't belong there. When we put ourselves there, stuff starts to go wrong. Now, I'm gonna jump into science for a second. This is really dangerous because I'm not really a scientist. But as I understand it, that's no longer a circle because of the way that the projector works, so this whole thing probably wouldn't work. But you have two forces. You have centrifugal force, which is like when you spin something in a circle is the thing that pushes stuff outwards. And then you have uh, the centripetal force, which is what pulls it into the middle. Now, I can demonstrate this with some toys. Um, so, if I spin this fairly fast, what happens is this, is that I injure someone, or myself more likely. Uh, so as I spin it like this, there's two forces working right. Uh, there's the force that's pulling it inwards, there's the, the thing like the, my, ar my arm and this thing that it's attached to is holding it there. There's another force that wants to pull it outwards. And so long as this force is stronger, it will stay where it is. If this force were to break as I spin it, it would go flying over to Duval at the back there and possibly wipe him out. And that's just how it works. So, okay, this doesn't really work with something this size. If I take something a little bigger, we get to see it in action a little more. So this is gonna take a little more faith from you guys in the back row. Uh, so, theoretically, as I spin this, what happens is, you see those two different forces working, and this force is just enough to keep it in place and not kill anyone, um, which is the goal of any good service in church. If everyone walks out living, if everyone's breathing, mission one accomplished. Those forces work uh, in our lives as well. What I would suggest is this. When we choose to put ourselves at the center, the inward force isn't strong enough. Jesus in the center is something that actually is strong enough to hold our lives together. When those other forces are working on us, when other things are pulling at us, when other things are messing with, uh, with us, somehow this Jesus in the center thing is strong enough to hold everything together. But us in the center just doesn't do that. There's a couple of examples that I think help us understand this. Um, when you hear about churches in other countries where Christianity is illegal, you hear that people go through the most incredible persecutions for their faith. And somehow, because of Jesus in the center, these people are able to walk through that. They're able to keep on going. This was the whole narrative for the early church. To say Jesus was Lord was to say that the rulers of that world, Caesar and his cohorts, weren't Lord. And the whole point of the Roman Empire, this big organization that, that ruled everything, was to keep that sense of Caesar is Lord over everything. They would go into a city and they would make that declaration, Caesar is Lord, and if you said yes, you got to live, and if you said no, then you died. To say Jesus was Lord was absolutely terrible for the Roman Empire. Yet these New Testament churches maintain that sense, no, Jesus is the center. Jesus is Lord. They were able to keep going with that because Jesus in the center was strong enough to hold their lives together. In our lives, when we take him out of the center, I think what happens is all those forces begin to work on us and suddenly it just doesn't make sense anymore. The inward force just doesn't keep us where we need to be with everything else working against us. 
I just got to hear an interview a few months ago with a guy called Russell Brand. It was really interesting to hear his, just, um, his perception on life. He's a British comedian, um, and he's gone through incredible battles with addiction. And he's talked about how he feels lucky in some ways. Because he said, as a celebrity, I had tons of money, so I got to do whatever I wanted. And he said, I have a real addictive tendency. He said, everyone has addictions. But most of our addictions are so mild, they don't really, we don't really know that they're there until we hit 60, 70, 80 maybe. Maybe we get to those ages and we're suddenly we're like, well, actually, I've been addicted to lots of things. Maybe I've been addicted to shopping. Maybe I've addi been addicted to success in my career. Maybe there's been this addiction lurking under the surface that I just wasn't aware of. He said, my addiction was so obvious that it, it ruined my life. But what he pointed out was this is, without something grounding you, all these other things pulling on you, there's nothing to keep them in check. Those centrifugal forces, the things that tempt us, the things that want to destroy us, they pull us further and further away. And somehow what you see through the church history is this Jesus in the center thing. It stops that. When we keep Jesus where he belongs, we're far more equipped to deal with those things that want to pull us away from center. We get to be this community that is Jesus-centric. Another way to say that might be this. Jesus is our lead story. Jesus is our lead story. In newspaper reporting terms, there's this phrase that you may have heard of, don't bury the lead. Don't bury the lead. This phrase comes from the Second World War. It's the idea of keeping the main story, the focus of everything that you're doing. It should be there at the beginning, and if you don't get to talking about the main point of your story until way, way down, there's a chance that nobody followed you long enough to capture what it actually was. This started in the Second World War because people were trying to report back what was happening over in the European continent, and the reporters were using military equipment. They never knew when the channels of communication might break down. They never knew when the military organizations might need to take over. So what they would have to do is this. They would give a news headline that was maybe seven words long that told you the basic element of the news. And then they would send that. Then they would send another report that might be 30 words long that had some extra details in it. And then they would send that. And then finally, they'd send the full report of 200, 300 words, and then they would send that. So they thought about news like an upside-down pyramid. So we all know what a pyramid looks like. To disorientate you, let's flip it upside-down like that, and it kind of gives you a moment of like looking at the sky. They thought about the top line being this really broad sense of what's the broad story? We are at war with the Germans. And then the next story might give more details. And the final story would give as many details as they possibly had. But the, third, the narrative was always, don't bury the lead. Don't bury the lead. If you don't give them the main story to begin with, there's a chance they'll never get the main story at all. One of the things I would say we get to do as a community is to not bury that lead. It's really easy to be a church that talks about Jesus in the center, but doesn't live it. We do this church, if you're visiting and you're not sure why we do this church, we do this church thing because we believe that this Jesus is the center of everything. We believe as ridiculous as his statements might seem, from a 21st century point of view and a first century point of view, we believe that they were true. We believe that when he said he would die and rise from the dead, he did that. And sometimes we can make the mistake of thinking that, well, those dear old first century people, of course they believed in things like resurrection of the dead. The, the fact is people stay dead in the first century with the same monotony that they do in the 21st century as well. We believe that when Jesus rose from the dead, it was because he wasn't just a man, that there was something more to his story. The ultimate value for this church has to be this sense of we are Jesus-centric. One of my favorite passages in the New Testament is this one, uh, that in all things, he may have the preeminence. Jesus is our lead story. The temptation may always be to let those other forces pull us away from center, but when we keep Jesus in the center as a community, we're on the right track. When we as individuals keep Jesus 
and the center of our lives. We're on the right track. So there's something that I would love to give you as just a little, a little thing to remember during the week. It's the idea, surrender the center. Surrender the center. The temptation for all of us in our own lives is to put ourselves right there in the middle. We do it as a species with this earth. We think we're the center of everything. We're not. We do it in our own lives. We make ourselves the center of everything. And one of the things I've found in my own life is this. When I put myself in the center, my whole sense of perspective gets thrown off. When I'm able to step back further and further and grab that 10,000 foot view and see that I don't belong in the center at all, the stuff that bothers me most of the time, it falls into place. We aren't the center. Jesus gets to be the center. This week, my encouragement to you, to us as a community, is simply that. We get to surrender the center. before you today. We put you above the music, above the singing. With open hearts, Lord, we just invite you in. Like a rock. 